Okay, so just FYI, this presentation is recorded. Um, for further use, we'll have it available online so that you can view it at a later time. We'll also email um, a link to the video. Um, you'll get that probably on Monday. Okay. All right, Peggy, can you see my screen again here? Yes. yes. OK, yeah, sorry about that, but I and do want to make sure we get the recording going. OK, so this was a, a really interesting article from the Wall Street Journal that, I, that just came out this week. And, uh, you know, we got into this whole trend at the beginning of COVID back in March where you couldn't find vegetable seeds. My wife couldn't find uh, chicken wire. Uh, she was using chicken wire to, to guard some seedlings, but everybody started raising chickens and started growing vegetables and, and knitting sweaters and, and everything uh, pre preparing for uh, the apocalypse. And so um, what we've seen is people have learned that vegetable garden is not easy. This is not something that you just go haphazardly and look at a video on YouTube and then buy seeds, plant them, and then uh, watermelon lands in your hands. It's, it's not like that. It's difficult, particularly if you don't have any training on it and you don't understand the basic considerations to understand. And so what we've seen here uh, is a huge amount of these people who uh, were got the kids out of the house and rolled up their sleeves and planted vegetable gardens did not have success with them and have bowed out of that game so we don't want you to be that person you don't want to be these defeated quarantine gardeners we want you to be successful so we're going to go over some considerations here and i think that these are very important uh, not just for the fall garden but for any time that we're going to get outside and do any type of gardening is uh, who's going to do the work is our first question. OK, and these are very simple questions, but they're very honest and that this is an everyday activity. OK, so when you when you get started, um, you're you're willing to go out there twice a day and you see your seeds germinating and you're weeding and you're keeping the plants healthy and you're harvesting when you're supposed to. Um, and then gradually one by one, uh, your helpers decide that they don't want to be outside and that it's hot and there's mosquitoes etc and so we have to know who is really going to be out there helping with this and so th that's uh, a big uh, consideration uh, there's willing workers and then there's enthusiastic workers and so you need to really define that and that's going to define how big of a garden you're, you're ready to uh, embark upon Next question is, what, what are we growing for? How many people are in this house? Are we going to just grow for us? Are we just going to kind of offset our food needs as far as vegetables and fruit? Or are we going to try to go uh, full force and, and really pr produce most of our, our garden produce at the house? Um, do we want to share it with neighbors? Do our neighbors really want uh, us growing produce for them? Uh, so, so think about that when you make those decisions, because if it's just three people in a house, that's a small garden. That's a really small garden that's easy to maintain. So make those decisions. Don't plant a big old garden where you're growing a whole bunch of food that you don't need. Uh, what type of stuff do you like to eat? OK, when I when when you go to the garden centers, you look at the seed packs or in the catalogs, there's lots of beautiful stuff that's in there. But but plant what you already eat. Don't grow produce that you think you're going to learn how to eat because that doesn't happen. What are you going to do with the excess bounty? Are you going to can it, freeze it, give it to neighbors? Be thinking about that because stuff like okra, stuff like squash, zucchinis, cucumbers, when they start producing, they don't stop and and you they're growing faster than you can eat them. 
So have a plan for what you're going to do with the access. And how much space do you have that's functionable garden space? And so what this slide here shows is what do we what do we need as far as space? Well, we need sunlight. You need to be honest about sunlight. OK, how, how much full sun? So that means I can look up and I can see that big red ball in the sky and there's not a tree branch or house or anything that's obstructing that sun and me. That's full sun. And particularly when we get into cool season crops, uh, these plants need full sun to grow. We need a well-drained soil um, that, you know, if, if you get an inch of rain, um, we don't want to be in an area where there's standing water for more than a couple hours there before it drains through. We want to avoid um, a septic drain and sprinkler fields. Uh, stay away from that. We don't want, um, we don't want that water. We want a close to an accessible potable water supply. So wherever you have a spigot, identify that early. Because if this is difficult to get water to, that's going to be one factor that's going to make you want to quit doing this. If you have to drag a water hose around the house, or if you have to fill up water buckets to get water to the garden, uh, you're going to get tired of that pretty quick. Avoid uh, areas near trees and shrubs. Um, one, that they have roots that are going to penetrate into our garden and compete with our vegetables for water and nutrients and trees obviously are going to produce uh, shade um, look at the path of sun so orient yourself to your landscape and we want you know the sun to move across this so if we're doing our rows if you're doing a row garden we want to put those rows going north to south so that as the sun moves across there, that we get good sun penetration on either side of those plants. And then just look, you know, if there are parts of the garden that, you know, maybe in midsummer, maybe you're getting full sun, but in midwinter, do we have a tree or a fence or something there as the sun moves lower into the southern sky? Are we not getting the, the full sun that we thought we were going to get uh, based off of what we saw in late summer? Um, Peggy, do we have any questions so far on this? No questions. No question. You must be doing it. <laughs> well, tell me if I need to slow down. I just want to try to run through all this, but if I'm going too fast, let me know. Okay, so getting our soil prepared. Um, soil is not something that is just static. Uh, this is something that we have to work on because we've got organic matter in, this, in our garden beds, and that gar organic matter is constantly decomposing and going away. So we, we don't have leaves, uh, we don't have dead animals and all the things that can provide organic material uh, like a forest would. We just have this bed here, and we're, since we're using the organic matter and it is decomposing, we have to constantly add more to it. So we would recommend that when we get ready to plant, that we spread a couple inches of good finished compost over the top of the whole garden bed, and then incorporate that into the top six inches of topsoil. And this is gonna replenish that uh, amount of lost organic matter to keep our soil healthy, to keep our microbiology active in the soil, uh, which is all very important things. Have your soil tested. You can see this bag here. Um, we've got a link uh, in, in uh, Peggy. If you wouldn't mind, if you get a chance there, is just to put the URL for the soil testing lab in the comment thread. And we will utilize the results from your soil tests to be able to adjust our fertility or pH as needed. And then here, keep it covered. Lots of different ways that we can keep this covered um, while the garden is fallow. Main reason here is weeds. I'm just keeping this bed covered up with either plastic, cardboard, uh, leaves, mulch, whatever. Uh, in between planting seasons, it's going to help you save yourself a lot of grief of having to go out and 
rip all those weeds and get that bed clear and ready for planting. So when we get uh, into our um, soil sample analysis, so you, you take soil from your beds, you send it to the laboratory, they, they send you back the analysis and recommendations. And so the first one would be pH, okay? And this is our acidity or alkalinity of the soil. And this is, uh, we probably know this is on a zero to 14 point scale where seven is neutral. So we want our soil to be between 6.5 and seven. Most plants like about a neutral pH. So if your pH is low, they're gonna recommend to add a lime to raise that up. If your pH is high, higher than seven, we're gonna recommend that you add sulfur and that's gonna lower your pH in the garden bed. And these, are, these aren't permanent because we can't really add enough of either of these to completely permanently change at the pH, but we can adjust it temporarily so that the pH is within the range that our plants want. Uh, gypsum, um, this uh, really we use this, it adds calcium and sulfur, but we use it as a way to loosen the soil, particularly if you have a heavy clay soil, we can add gypsum into that, incorporate it into the soil, and it fractures those clay particles and allows more water and oxygen down into the root system. And so other, other things we could add here, uh, wood ashes, uh, adds some um, nutrients as well as alters our pH. Other amendments that we can add in here that are organic amendments are mushroom compost, cottonseed meal, alfalfa meal, worm castings, kelp, and our synthetic fertilizers. And we do this based off of our uh, analysis. If it tells us we need, you know, so many pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, et cetera, uh, we want to apply uh, as close as we can get. You know, we don't have to be spot on, but we do want to amend the soil to try to address the deficiencies within our soil sample um, so that our plants have the um, the food that they want in the soil. And of course, organic matter, uh, compost, 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 it's very important. So that's in the soil. And then we wanna be thinking about a mulch to put on the surface of the soil. And so mulch is, you know, at some point it's going to turn into compost. It is gonna decompose and and turn into humus and re-release re nutrients back into the soil. But what we use mulch for is on top. It's not incorporated into the ground. And these are, the benefits here are to regulate soil temperature, uh, to help our soil retain moisture, uh, retarding uh, bolting. And this is when the plants are stressed and they start trying to flower early. And so they're producing flowers and seeds instead of leaves. Uh, this is going to retard weed development. So it's going to stop our seeds uh, of weeds from being able to get water and sunlight and to germinate. And then as it breaks down, it's going to feed uh, our plants in the garden. So we'll mulch, mulch, mulch. What is the mulch? Uh, this could be lots of different things here. So there are uh, what we call synthetic mulches, plastic. So there's different types there that we basically just roll that out over the surface. And that uh, obviously is not uh, organic um, matter, but this is a, an easy way for us to um, keep weeds out of the garden. I believe we have maybe one person that has their microphone turned on. If we can go ahead and there you go. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next one are newspapers. Uh, also, it could be um, cardboard here as well. Multiple layers of newspaper and then either rocks or staples or something you're going to need here to hold this down. Okay, because if you just put newspaper out or cardboard out, 
And then we have Tropical Storm Beta decides to come across here. This is going to be all over your neighborhood. OK, so find a way to hold that down. Organic mulches, stuff that I recommend. Uh, leaves, we all have trees, so rake the leaves up. Um, if you have a way that you can shred, particularly oak leaves, uh, if you can shred those a little bit first with the mower and then rake those back up or, or from a bagger, use that. Uh, pine needles are one of my favorites because they are nice and fluffy and they do break down pretty quickly after um, the season is over with. Uh, a lot of people use rice holes. Uh, this is a byproduct of the rice industry around here. So you can buy bags of rice holes or if you're lucky enough to live close to one of the rice mills, you can find bulk rice holes. You can get a small square bales of alfalfa hay. And uh, these are these are great uh, mulches because th when they break down, they do provide a lot of good organic matter in the soil. Uh, composted cotton burrs, again, uh, we've got a, um, a, a cotton oil facility uh, here in Richmond, and you can get the cotton burrs there or any of the cotton gins and um, makes a great uh, mulch. And then it actually is high in nitrogen. So as it breaks down, we release a lot of nitrogen back into the soil. Grass clippings are great. But uh, some considerations with grass clippings, unfortunately, a lot of people are using herbicides on their lawn, and this could be either liquid weed killers or weed and feed granular weed killers. Um, those aren't going to work. OK, so if 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 you're using those at home, don't use those grass clippings. If you pick up bags of grass clippings from your neighbors, uh, make sure that you know that they haven't applied any herbicides to that grass because that's going to try to kill our garden plants. That's a herbicide. Other thing is seeds, particularly like if it's a Bermuda grass lawn and there's seed heads in there, when we uh, harvest those clippings, we're taking those seeds of either the grass or weeds maybe that are in the garden and we're spreading those out on our garden bed and they're going to germinate and uh, cause a, a real nightmare for us. So mulch, mulch, mulch. Peggy, any questions? No, no ben. Ben. great. Thank you. OK, well, let's get into water here real quick. Water considerations are very important. We want to have a source of water and there's lots of um, ways that we get water. So rain. Uh, is the best you know, when rain falls. It's got minerals and nutrients in it. It's clean. And so that's what the plants like the best. So just letting that fall in the garden, uh, making sure we have a rain gauge somewhere around the garden so that we can measure how much rainfall we've gotten. Uh, we can use rain barrels with rainwater harvesting to collect that rainwater and then deliver it to the garden. Uh, other ways that are common are either uh, hose in sprayers, overhead sprinklers, uh, which uh, provide water as we need it. Not the best. I wouldn't recommend overhead watering or hose in sprayers because we could be causing some disease issues by getting the leaves wet of the plants. Uh, so we strongly encourage if you can develop a drip irrigation infrastructure, it's really the way to go because we get the water into the soil, to the roots. Plants are happy and we're not getting the leaves wet here like we would with the overhead sprinklers that may cause some disease issues. So don't be this guy. We plants need water, but they don't need a ton of water. And what we tend to do is we overwater. We see a problem. Plants don't look right. They look wilted or or discolored uh, and it's probably because of too much water already and so a lot of people make the mistake of adding more water on top of that and making the problem worse so uh, some considerations here is about one inch of water a week okay and that's combined irrigation and natural rainfall so rain gauge is very important 
um, dump the rain gauge out after you've measured it so that we can we can get an honest uh, gauge of that. And then we're just adjusting our irrigation based off of any deficiencies with natural rainfall. When you water, we want to water infrequently, but we want to water deeply. And so that means don't to get this one inch, don't don't do it. Um, you know, a, a quarter inch every day or every other day. Uh, water once a week or maybe twice a week. So it's half inch and half inch. OK, so we were in doing that. We're trying to get this water to go down deeper into the soil and trying to encourage the roots of our plants to go deeper as well. And that's going to make bigger, healthier plants for us. So if we're not sure how deep we're getting, you can buy these cheap uh, moisture meters from the garden centers that you can push down into the soil that will show you um, the depth of uh, moisture in the soil. And, uh, and that's important because a lot of times the surface may look very dry and that's because of sunlight and wind exposure. But if we rake that soil a little bit, we, we're probably going to find that um, that that is actually in good shape. OK, now newly seeded areas, they're going to need obviously more water temporarily as the seedlings emerge. So for the first maybe two weeks while those seeds are germinating, it's be going out there maybe every every day and doing a light watering over the surface so that those tender young roots have moisture that they can they can penetrate and absorb and that it doesn't get so dry within that top inch of soil that those plants actually wilt and die. Yeah, I've used this slide in several of the presentations, but it's always very important that we're moving our crops around each year. We do have insects and particularly a lot of soil borne diseases that are plant family specific. And so if we've got a couple beds in our garden is is draw out a little map like this each year, put the season and then show where you've planted each of those crops and then keep that in a little folder or a binder. So you can go back and say, all right, last year I I had some legumes in this bed. I had some of my root crops here. I had my peppers and eggplants and tomatoes, my solanaceous plants here. And then I had my leafy uh, vegetables here, which these tend to be in a, 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 a number of different families here. And so you just kind of swap that. OK, you move these over, move those over. And within a four year period, you're back to the beginning. And so the diseases that are maybe specific to peas and beans are not to onions and leeks and carrots, etc. So we're kind of just staying ahead of those diseases as they become active in the soil. Um, you know, it's not to say that this isn't foolproof, but it's going to just help us quite a bit to avoid uh, insect and disease pressure. OK, I've got a little video here. Uh, you might have to adjust your speakers as needed. See if it plays right for us. Well, I was lucky enough to get us a behind the scenes tour of the propagation area here in Enchanted Garden. What you're looking at right here is a shimmering sea of fall vegetable transplants. We have some mustard greens, and then we got some cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, etc., uh, spread out along these beds. And one thing that I wanted to show you here is the uniformity in this crop. Very healthy, uh, young, vigorous young seedlings that have been thinned properly, thinned properly. This is one thing that's important for you to remember because 
what we want is, in this case, we have this red cabbage, ruby ball red cabbage. And in here, we have one seedling. It's got a couple sets of leaves on here. It's very healthy. It's got a very, very nice moist soil, some fertilizer in here, some slow release fertilizer. This is a very healthy young plant. And this is going to get us what we want is this beautiful red head of cabbage, hopefully before midwinter sets in. If we can get this plant put in the ground now, early in the fall, while it still has time to grow, we may get this out of here by mid-November, maybe even in time by Thanksgiving for a young head of cabbage. If we start with the plant that has here multiple seedlings, in this case here, not to beat this up because it is healthy, there's three little seedlings in this plant. Okay, so what's gonna happen here is that these three plants are going to compete with each other. It's gonna take longer for this to mature for us. So more than likely, if I put this out, I'm gonna get a couple heads of cabbage off of this as they spread out, but I'm not gonna get those or I'm not gonna get the size of them um, till later in the year, probably into spring next year before I would be able to harvest um, this so that's why thinning is very important and then if you see across here and these plants they right now they may look kind of sparse but it's because we have one to two seedlings in each of those container within two weeks these are going to fill up those containers and almost be over mature right now is the is the primo time these are going to come out of here they're going to go on the shelf here in the next week and they're gonna be grabbed up and go out into people's gardens. The longer that they stay in these containers, the taller they get, the lankier they get, leggy, the foliage becomes yellow because they need more space to grow. They need more rooting space, more space to sprawl out for more sunlight. So getting started early with healthy, properly grown transplants is crucial in this fall garden game. Okay, this morning, I'm in Enchanted Gardens Nursery in Richmond, Texas. And we're just starting to set out fall vegetable transplants. Just want to give you an idea of what you should be looking for when you go to the nursery. Right here, we've got a good spread of plants. Look up and down the rows, underneath the row here. Everything that's out here looks very healthy. Just a quick visual inspection. Next thing here, we got this Mizuno mustard. Uh, green here is we want to inspect the plant. We, we see up on top, we do have some really nice foliage here, but also come down and look at the lower stem, make sure there's no aphids or any discoloration on here. Also, if we look at the bottom of the pot here, we see these white fibrous roots growing out of the bottom, which uh, indicates that we have a very healthy, robust root system on this plant. So this, this one right here is ready to go. And similarly, as we walk down the row here, we wanna look for the same thing. You know, we got good green on the sides of this plant. No yellow, no insect damage, no chewed up leaves on there. And again, we turn this upside down. See these white fibrous roots on the bottom. If we're gentle, we should be able to lift this up and see the roots all white, uh, really fresh, robust roots in there. No brown roots. So a good plant, a good choice right here. Okay, we're here today at Caldwell Nursery in Plague, Texas. And we're going to talk a little bit about seeds. Okay, 
first thing here is that we've got a new rack of seeds. These are fresh seeds that just came in this season. That's what you want to look for. Don't buy old vegetable seeds. They're one, two, or three years old. The germination rate is going to go downhill each year, and you're not going to get the success that you want out of those plants. Other thing is, is that this is a locally owned family business here in Fort Bend County. They're going to have varieties on the shelf that are proven to grow for us. If you go to one of the box stores and look at their shimmering sea of seeds, you may or may not find varieties that are proven to do well in our area. So what I always recommend is that you look up the seed selections from our charts, print those off and bring those with you when you go to the nursery to be able to cross compare with some of those varieties to try to find the things that you're looking for. <clears throat> Other thing is what's the difference between seeds and transplants, okay? Some things over here, we've got some lettuce, we've got some kale, maybe broccoli, uh, cauliflower, etc. Plants that we can grow from small transplants. And the benefit there is that those plants are getting a head start. We put those little four inch transplants in the garden. We're getting several weeks of speeding up that process to get to harvest before it gets too cold outside. So you can choose either way on some of those. But some plants like carrots, for instance, <clears throat> they don't transplant very well from containers. So we would recommend going from seed on these. Just sprinkle the seeds down the row as you see in the chart. One thing that's important with these and your kale and your kohlrabi, <clears throat> spinach, etc., is that we do thinning on those crops. Okay, Once they grow up, even if we're good at this, we're going to plant those seeds too thick. So you need to come in, you got to thin out the little bunches of seeds where they're too close together and then come back another week or two later and you'll see which ones are going to be your dominant plants and then thin out one more time to space those out appropriately. If you don't know, <clears throat> always just follow the label on the back and it's going to tell you the recommended plant spacing at maturity on when you're doing your thinning. All right. Peggy, any, any questions, any comments on those videos? We have one question, Boone, and it has to do with mulch. Uh, this is before okay, you okay. started into the videos. Uh, and the question is, can we use the composted cotton burr as, a, uh, as we would think of a regular mulch in our landscape beds around our bushes and shrubs? Of, co of course. Yeah, you could. The... Um, the, the problem with that is that they these do break down very readily and very rapidly. So as far as the landscape mulch in a, in a landscape planting bed, it probably is not a good standalone product because you're going to, as it breaks down, you're going to start getting soil exposure and you're going to have problems with weeds, et cetera. So uh, not a bad idea to put on for a soil amendment like a compost. Uh, but as a mulch, as a standalone mulch, uh, I tend to recommend a wood mulch, hardwood mulch is uh, probably our most common recommendation for landscape planting beds. We have one more question, Boone, um, and it has to do with radishes um, and whether or not, I believe it's pronounced daikon radish grows in our area. Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll cover that uh, later on in the presentation. We're good. We're good. Cool. All right. So just real quick, I'm going to be covering all these crops individually, but uh, just to give you a little synopsis, uh, we do have some plants which are not necessarily cool season crops, but what we would call transitional crops that we can plant now and um, reap the benefit of that before it gets to freezing weather, right? And these would be uh, some beans, uh, pod peas, uh, squash, tomatoes. And some people act, you know, we're kind of late for tomatoes and peppers, et cetera. But if you can race those along, you may be able to get a harvest off of them. But, you know, every day that goes by towards the end of September, 
uh, our chances of those being successful are going to diminish. And then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about our actual cool season vegetables, uh, plants that do like it cold, that can handle some amount of freezing weather to get us through the winter months. Okay, let's see here if this will play. Okay, well, what are we growing here in this garden? Any ideas? Kind of hard to tell. All we see is these little wet spots here in the bed. We've got a soil that's been cultivated very well, weed free. And we've got little raised up hills and we've got some wet spots in here where we've been doing some hand watering. These are Irish potatoes. And while we would think of normally growing Irish potatoes for a spring garden for the larger size. Fall is a, is a pretty good time. We've got a little window of opportunity in the fall to grow uh, new potatoes, fingerling potatoes, smaller types that don't take quite as long to produce for us. So this would be a great idea here if you've got some space uh, to put in some potato slips this time of year. Uh, just uh, take those, those slip potatoes, uh, cut it with the cut eyes, make sure they're good and dry, place them in the ground and just keep them watered. And then uh, probably here, these were planted last week. Those will start to sprout probably next week. And we're going to nurture those plants and they're going to continue to grow until we get our first killing frost in winter. For us, that tends to be usually uh, first part to the first half of December. That's plenty of time from the middle of September where we're at right now to be able to get a big, beautiful bush out of these plants and to produce plenty of the starch roots underground uh, for us to uh, grow tubers that we want to grow underground and, uh, and to harvest those about the time we get that first killing frost. Uh, the larger varieties, Probably not the best idea, but if you can get some new potato varieties, if we can get some fingerling varieties, those would be the ones that we would want to try for the fall, uh, being that we don't get a frost early. Sometimes we are surprised in the middle of uh, November, e even the end of October. But if we, if we try our luck right and we don't get that killing frost until the 1st of December, we should end up getting a pretty sizable crop of Irish potatoes. Okay, so we see here, uh, this is the uh, potato plant. This is going to form a large bush. It has actually pretty attractive uh, white and uh, purple flowers on it. And we're just going to let that grow until we get a killing frost. And you're going to know when that happened because you're going to, about halfway through the day, the next, the next day, these are going to just be like they've been microwaved. Um, and you can leave those in the ground for a while if you're not ready to harvest them. But um, at some point, uh, once we once that happens, uh, they're not going to grow anymore. So we want to get in there and and go ahead and dig those up and and store them, dry them good, get the dirt off of them as much as we can, and then you know put them put them somewhere in a in a, a dry, uh, dark spot. Uh, so that they don't start trying to sprout again. And I say the slips here, uh, if you haven't grown potatoes, basically we just, you know, if you've got, uh, you can buy what's called certified seed potatoes, or you can just purchase potatoes uh, from the store, uh, wet those a little bit uh, in water, set them out on some paper towels and the window seal, and then pretty soon these little eyes are going to swell up and then you can cut those into pieces. As long as we have one or two of those eyes on each piece, then we let them sit out, usually about half a day, till this wet area dries up. We want that to dry up or scab up before we put those in the ground, or they will just rot in the ground. So you gotta have that dried up before they go into the soil. 
uh, green beans. Um, we have um, pole beans, which you see in the picture here that just are vining that keep going up and up and up. Uh, for the fall, uh, really bush type are going to be what we want to go with. And these are low, uh, lower to the ground. They kind of stand up on their own and um, they produce a smaller plant and then they start flowering much faster. So with the timeline that we have, because as soon as we get a killing frost, these beans are done. So we don't want the plant to spend a whole lot of time growing into this large vine. We want it just a good sized little plant and we want it to start flowering and fruiting as quick as possible. And, and with these, harvest these early and often, because as you harvest them, the plant's going to reflower and it's gonna keep producing more. If we leave them on the plant until these pods get big, thick and dry, the plant's gonna slow down. It's not gonna produce as much fruit for us. Um, lima beans um, is a little bit more of a robust plant for us. Get these put in the ground quick. Again, bush types here. Um, um, these ones here, we want to uh, let these stay on the plant a little bit longer uh, so that these peas have time to mature. Where in those, in those bush beans, we're going to eat those whole po pods whole. Uh, but on these here, we want these, the peas, the beans in here to actually size up. Uh, squash, uh, it says fall squash, but you know, these are what we would typically call summer squash for us. And these are our yellow or straight or crook neck squash and green zucchinis. If you've grown either of these before, uh, we, we plant these uh, direct from seed. And within a week, the plant is growing. Within three weeks, it's it's pretty mature looking and it starts flowering and fruiting. So if we get them in the ground now, we can get a pretty good growth. We can get a pretty reasonable harvest off of these. Uh, they are not cold hardy. So when we do get our first killing frost, these are finished. So plant them early, um, get, them, get them going and then um, be prepared for them to freeze and then pull, pull the plants out of the garden. Uh, same thing with these, once, once they do start producing, I like to, like on the straight neck squash or zucchinis, I like these about six inches long, six to eight inches uh, narrow. If we leave them on for another day after that, um, they're like a, a, a salt club. Uh, they grow very, very fast. So pull them off the plant. When they're ready, the plant will keep producing flowers and producing more fruit the more that we harvest it. Uh, edible pod peas um, are, are great. Um, and again, one that um, when we plant those from seed, they are going to germinate pretty quickly. We will need some trellising as we see on both of these pictures here because these produce vines and tendrils. These are the little modified leaves or tendrils. So we have to have something for that, those tendrils to grab a hold of and lift themselves onto or else they're going to just crawl around on the ground and with rainfall, etc. The pods are going to get uh, dirty. You're going to have disease problems. So get them, get them up, and um, keep them clean. A lot of these, I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the individual varieties during the presentation. When we get closer to the end, uh, we'll show you some resources where, where we'll list where you can access uh, the recommended varieties of each of these choices. Uh, broccoli uh, is one of uh, my favorite cool season crops. Uh, we have uh, really two things that happen with broccoli is we get this um, terminal flower um, 
that you see here that's large. And then if once we've harvested that, the plants will side shoot and then they'll produce kind of what we call broccolini, which are just little small and more immature looking flower heads. Uh, so once you harvest that first one, don't rip the plant up, leave it there and let those side shoots come off because you can keep producing more uh, heads off of it. Further than that, the leaf greens are basically cabbage, so you can cook those leaves as well. Uh, one thing you see right here, if we plant these now, like if we get a jump start and get some transplants in the ground, we can get these harvested um, in December. And then we can plant another crop of them for spring. Okay, so you plant them in just in January and we'll get another crop of them uh, in spring. If if we wait now, if we wait too long, these plants aren't going to start flowering until um, early winter for us. So this is definitely crucial. Get these going uh, ASAP. Uh, basically the sister to broccoli, um, the same, same stuff here. Uh, lots of different types of cauliflower, uh, colors, shapes, um, and it's the same thing. Once you harvest the the uh, terminal head, uh, leave it there. It'll start producing some side shoots, and you'll have sm very much smaller heads. But uh, you can get those off of there, and you can harvest these leaves and cook them like you would cook cabbage or kale. Um, lots of different types of cabbages. One thing that's important with these is that we have appropriate spacing. If you plant cabbages too close together, uh, a couple things are going to happen. One, the heads are not going to mature into, you know, large, you know, clustered heads. And we're going to start having some insect and disease problem in between these plants. OK, so we've, we're creating a little habitat for pests to live underneath here and start eating these leaves. And then when we pull those up, we'll see that there's a lot of insect damage uh, on, on those lower leaves. So so read the spacing, you know, on, on cabbages. I'm thinking 14 uh, to 16 inches apart. That gives a pretty good amount of spacing for these outer leaves to spread out. They're going to be touching, but the, the, they're not this close. This is this maybe is a little too close. Uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, despite some radio celebrities in our region um, saying that these don't work for us, um, they are proven. Uh, we have to have good weather, and Brussels sprouts like cool weather. So, uh, yeah, if we do have a year where we start getting nice cool fall weather and then we get one of these uh indian summers that come on in in november and it gets pretty warm and humid um yeah that could cause some problems and those are bad years for brussels sprouts because these little sprouts on the side of the stems they they start opening up and we don't want that we want those little those little sprouts on the sides to stay tightly balled on there. And that's really when we want to harvest those when they're mature, but when they're tightly bundled. If we start getting the warm weather, these get encouraged to so start opening up and sprouting and we lose those sprouts. But if we have a good, cool, consistently cool weather, we can grow some fantastic Brussels sprouts. Uh, some other relatives to cabbage here, collards, kale, uh, kohlrabi. Uh, this is one of those ones that I mentioned earlier is, you know, this is a beautiful little plant. OK, but if we if we don't know what we're going to do with this little kohlrabi stem. We may be wasting time, but all these are basically cabbages, so we can eat this. 
We can eat these stems. We can eat the leaves. Every part of this plant is edible and it's going to taste like cabbage. So if we cut this up and put it all in stir fry with a little bit of uh, soy sauce, some ginger or something, it's going to taste like a stir fried cabbage. One thing to consider with these leafy greens like this is, is again, don't plant them too close together because if we start getting them too densely planted, we are going to get problems with insects, particularly most common on these are leaf beetles. And the leaf beetles uh, lay eggs in there, the larvae start feeding. And as we start harvesting, there's beetles, there's dead leaves, there's beetle frass, and it's it can get kind of gross. And that's just because we planted too close together. We want a little spacing in between these plants. Okay, so before I move on to this one, Peggy, do we have any questions on hold? Um, let's see. Yes, there was a question, uh, well, two things actually. The question about um, squash, any advice on controlling squash vine borers? And then the other question had to do with what, when you're recommending getting something in quick or early, does that pertain to both transplanting and sowing, depending on which crop and the recommended means that we're uh, considering for the particular crop? Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, on the squash borers, uh, good, good luck with those, uh, particularly late season, because we do have more pressure with the with the moths. Um, the late late summer. Um, is when those moths tend to, the populations tend to be most active. Um, so monitoring, uh, those moths are uh, orange and black. It's actually a pretty attractive looking moth that uh, usually you'll see right around dusk in the garden. Um, so it would be just trying to uh, intercept those moths and terminate them if you see them. If we get rid of the adult, then it's not laying eggs on the plants. Um, once we uh, see the damage, you know, some people have had luck with razor blades of just making a, a, a slit through the vine, a nice clean slit uh, that's sanitary will actually kill the, the larvae that's burrowing into the stem and then the plant will heal over that. Uh, other solutions would be to do a protective layer of a BT uh, insecticide. So these product labels would be Dipel or Thuricide. And so as those plants are just about fully grown, like they're starting to produce flowers, that's usually when we start seeing pressure with the squ squash vine borers. So you would spray uh, weekly uh, with BT uh, making sure that you spray that product uh, down towards the nodes where the leaves connect to the vine or the stem because that's where those eggs are usually deposited by the adult moth. Um, the timing on this, I, I think I've got that ca uh, planting calendar embedded here again one more time and I'll go over the timing, but basically the earlier the better with any of these. When we look at that that green on the on the planting chart, um, that's when these plants uh, really need to get going. And I've got a, a another little video um, that shows a little bit about you know the fact that it's still pretty hot outside, and we're talking about plants that like cold weather. Uh, but we have to challenge ourselves and we have to challenge those plants um, a little bit so that we get a head start on the planting season that they want to be growing in. So we usually we have to plant them while it's still hot so that once they get up that um, the weather is changing to uh, weather that's more conducive for their growth. So we'll get our harvests out of those plants much quicker. 
One more question, Boone. How deep do potatoes need to grow? Yeah, we're, we're going to just barely plant those. We just we don't want to go too deep or they'll they won't grow or they'll rot in the soil. So so basically, depending on the size of the, the slips that you have, um, just barely beneath the, the soil surface, I'd say probably two two inches with the top portion of that piece of potato, uh, an inch or so beneath the soil surface. Because that's, you know, all that's doing where the eye is, that's producing roots and those roots are migrating down and then the growth tip is coming from that point. So the, the potatoes actually grow along root strands down deeper and then uh, around the, the, the perimeter of the plant. So that's, you, you don't have to, you don't have to go very deep. Okay, on carrots, again, like I mentioned in the video, this is one that really we want to just direct seed. And it's one that the seeds don't really germinate until we get cool weather. So, uh, so that's kind of right upon us. We want to look at these night temperatures starting to drop down into the lower 60s. Uh, and that may be enough to get these seeds to germinate. Uh, you just basically sprinkle these in rows and lightly cover them. Um, and, and usually what I do is just use my finger and make a line, sprinkle seeds into that, and then just grab a handful of soil and then just lightly dust over the top of those. You're not really burying those seeds. You're just trying to cover them just a little bit so that they don't dry out as they're germinating. And you can stagger the plantings of carrots um, so that you don't end up with all of them maturing at the same time. So, you know, if you've got a four, four by four bed, as I'd plant, you know, one strip and then a week later plant another strip, so on, you know, do four or five strips. And so that will stagger your harvest to the size that you want. You know, we don't want little babies and we don't want really big woody uh, uh, roots on there. We want to harvest them at the peak maturity. And so that, that will allow us to prolong that, that harvest. Uh, beets, uh, again on these, we can buy these as transplants, uh, but uh, they do uh, germinate pretty quickly in the soil. Uh, again, when we put these out, we're going to probably plant too many too close together. So you want to thin them appropriately because that one beet, it needs space for it to spread out in every direction. So if you have a bunch of plants close together, that you don't really get the starchy root that you would expect because they don't have room to spread out underground. So you have to thin them out to one plant and space those out um, you know, probably six, eight, 12 inches apart in the garden so that there's plenty of room for that, for that root to develop. And beets and chard or Swiss chard are, are basically the same plant. They've been modified. One produces this little beet uh, root, other one doesn't, but the beet uh, leaves are basically Swiss chard. So you can harvest the leaves and stems of these as well and uh, and cook those down and they're they're pretty tasty. Lettuce and spinach. Um, I'll be honest with you, there's there's head lettuce, which would be like your romaine type lettuces. And then there's leaf lettuce. And so I, I tend to say um, we get the we get a better product out of the leaf lettuces for us because you continually harvest that. So we, we as we see in the picture here, that's a little tight, but you, you just broadcast the seed across a, a planting area and let it grow up. And then we just take a knife or some scissors and cut the leaves off of that, kind of mow it down 
and then within a week or two it's going to look like that again and then you cut more off of it and you can keep doing that until we were out of the planting season or sometimes we'll just wear the plants out and they'll start getting some disease and insect pressure but you can get a lot more harvest off of these leaf lettuces than you could off of waiting to grow one head lettuce and a lot of times for us since we do have a lot of insect pressure uh, about the time we're ready to harvest the head of lettuce we find out that there's some caterpillars that got inside of there and made a big mess out of it so you're going to have a much better experience out of the, the leaf varieties uh, same thing with spinach that's really how you grow spinach is just plant it in a large bed and you know every every couple days we're just cutting off the, the more mature leaves and letting it grow back and continually doing that and you'll get you know maybe a, a, a dozen harvests off of this bed before those plants start declining so lots of fun here but you want to get them going uh, as soon as possible so that we can reap the benefit out of this fall growing season because once it gets cold in December and January these plants aren't really growing anymore they kind of just sit there so we want to capitalize on the on the fall of uh, getting a good harvest before they slow down for midwinter uh, onions uh, garlic um, you know we're, we're getting close right now start heading to the garden centers uh, you'll see uh, fall onions and uh, either either uh, sets or you'll find dry uh, young bulbs of either onions or garlic in the garden centers uh, space those out appropriately don't plant them too tight so that they do have room for the bulbs to to develop um, if you've got a heavy soil we either want to amend that soil significantly uh, or we want to raise that up with a brought in a garden soil uh, something that's not heavy clay so these these have a hard time swelling up when we have a heavy soil um, so raise them up and then do some amendments to the soil to make it looser uh, these um, these are heavy users of nitrogen they're growing very quick so they're using a lot of nitrogen for their green growth so it's recommended to offset fertilizer um, frequently probably weekly is just do a side dress of a nitrogen fertilizer on these plants uh, to, to keep them growing to keep those leaves nice and green if we slow down on the nitrogen we're going to find these stems are going to get yellow and weak and at some point uh, probably even experience the top of the plant will lodge over because it, it doesn't have enough energy in here to keep that stem turgid so that it will stand up on its own um, a relative to both of those uh, if you can find a leak uh, either small plants or or uh, bases um, slips in the garden center this is a great one It's basically a leak is a mild form of garlic that's not quite as pungent for us in in foods and um, lots of different uses we can cut these greens off of the top and, and put those in 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 foods uh, but the main use down here is this white uh, succulent base that's that's very mild in flavor, uh, very crunchy, and it's a uh, makes for some nice dishes. Uh, a couple other ones are our turnips, uh, mustards. Uh, pretty easy to grow, very fast growing plants in the garden. Uh, don't need a whole lot of TLC uh, so these are these are ones that uh, particularly if you've got extra space in the garden 
Uh, we will just direct seed into those garden beds and lightly cover the seeds. And as they grow, we definitely want to thin them out early on. Uh, if they get too clustered, then we start getting aphids. These get aphids really bad, and it's usually because we have them too close together uh, in the in the planting bed. And they they really love this tender young growth here. So if we can space those out, and if we've got the proper soil fertility, the plants grow pretty quick. So my recommendation on these is usually to get it up as quick as you can, harvest the foliage off of these, harvest the young turnips here, and then get these out of the garden before they get inundated with uh, aphids and white fly in the garden. Uh, we did have a question about daikon uh, rad uh, and just our, our normal garden radishes. Uh, great choices. Uh, fast growing plants. So these are one that we might be able to get multiple plantings in, in both sides of the season. So for fall, we could probably um, plant these twice and, and get a continual harvest off of them. And then in the spring, starting in January, is planting again for a spring crop. Um, 30 days on some of these varieties here. Uh, this is this uh, French breakfast radish here. Um, the little cherry bell radishes, um, particularly for kids and in children gardens. Uh, these are fun because they're they're great reward plants because they grow so fast and within 30 days of planting from seed, you can get these small uh, radishes to, uh, to harvest. Um, don't wait too long. Harvest them when they're young, when they're at the right size here, because the longer you wait, this becomes woody and starchy uh, and you lose the sweetness uh, of these and they just they just taste like like wood at that point. Uh, daikon is, um, I don't have a picture of the daikon on here, but this is very large uh, Japanese white radish. Um, it's a great choice for us, but again, uh, it is fast growing. Uh, don't let it stay too long. You're going to see what it, what the daikon tends to do is that when it's ready, the the, the radish actually will grow up out of the ground. So if you see it look like it's trying to come out of the soil, it's ready to go. Uh, the longer that we leave that in there, uh, it's going to lose its flavor and it's going to basically just taste like cellulose, uh, like wood. Um, so, so get those planted, space them out appropriately so that they have plenty of room and then um, and then get them up as soon as you see the white part of that radish on the daikon pushing up out of the soil um, it's time to come up depending on your soil type or the depth of your soil you may need a sharpshooter shovel to harvest those because uh, we have had problems where you start pulling it doesn't want to come up and you'll break half of that large radish off down into the ground so if it doesn't want to come up on its own, don't force it. Just take a shovel and uh, dig down around it to uh, to get it out. Uh, any questions, Peggy? How about, How about watermelon, watermelon radishes in our area? Oh yeah, uh huh. Yeah, that's just that's just a kind of a a a, a cool variety that you know is by color, uh, so definitely. But uh, again, with that is it'll have on the label it's probably going to say uh 35 to 40 days so that's you know when you plant the seed just mark on your calendar to give you an idea of when you need to go out there to start harvesting those because they're they're going to be that perfect size it's going to be like a, a, a half dollar size radish that's going to be very sweet it's going to have very good color, but the longer that you leave it in the soil, it's going to lose the color and it's going to lose the flavor that we want.
Hmm. And now let's see. I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to just show this video here. See what happens. Okay, okay. I'm, here I'm here today in my friend Chuck's garden, and he's just gotten some fall vegetables put in the ground. You can see right here we've got some Brussels sprout transplants. Over here we have some cauliflower transplants. What's the one thing that we kind of noticed that's going on with these right here? wilting these plants are wilting okay the soil is moist it's got good moisture in here it's been prepared well there's some fertilizer on the ground but y'all it's 90 plus degrees outside right now it's sunny and it's pretty breezy all factors that are going to take a cool weather loving plant and make it start wilting because it's losing more moisture through transpiration than it's able to gain from its root system because it hasn't established yet. So right now, while these are, they look like right here, they look a little wilty, within a week or two, not gonna be a problem. And actually this is kind of a good experience for a young plant to go through a little bit of that stress to make it try to root out faster to be able to start absorbing more moisture. So within two or three weeks, we're gonna start seeing some cooler temperatures here. These plants are gonna be rooted in and they're gonna take off and they're gonna be spectacular. So don't freak out if the short term, your plants look wilted because the, the problem that you could get yourself into is you may be tempting, tempted to overwater your plants. Right here, if I, like again, if I dig into the soil, it's, uh, it's very moist. It's actually the perfect moisture for these plants, okay? But if I responded right now to this wilting and applied more water, the water is gonna be, be spongy wet um, and we're going to lack oxygen down into the root zone. And those plants are actually gonna suffer because of it. So be careful. We wanna give them the amount of water that they need, but we don't wanna overwater them. If we do everything else the way we're supposed to do, like we see here in this garden, but once the cool season comes, these plants are going to be up and ready to go. Okay. Just wanted to share that before I moved on to the herbs. Okay. One thing we'll be covering today are herbs, transition our herbs into the fall garden. And while we have some of these standard perennial herbs, rosemary, oregano, that can be planted multiple times throughout the year, these plants are gonna continue to grow. They're gonna, they're gonna perennialize, which means they're gonna grow every year. If you care for these appropriately, provide the amount of sunlight that they need, spacing, these will get bigger, produce more for you year after year before they start declining. But what we have a lot of right here are some young fall annual herb transplants. This right here is bronze fennel. It's a beautiful uh, fennel species that uh, has a, not only a great color, but adds uh, a nice sweet taste to a lot of dishes. And then here we have some dill. Again, you're looking for characteristics here, good green stems on here, nice green, robust foliage on this plant, young roots coming out of the bottom of the container. So it's appropriate for us to plant these in the garden now. Today's high temperature is gonna be about 90 degrees, really hotter than this plant likes to be in. But what's important is for us to get this into our garden and get it producing roots and get it established just before 
the cool season comes on because that's going to make this plant really grow up and fill in the garden much quicker instead of if we bought this plant once the temperature's cooled off it's going to take longer to root in and we're not going to get the foliage mass that we want until later in the year and possibly till it gets too cold All right, let's see here. I'm going to do a bunch of moving up here, way back up. Watch your eyes. I'm sorry about all this. But I want to go back to this. I want to go back to this real quick. Okay. So th this is this is important here. And one thing that maybe I, I didn't note on on this chart is that we have like here beets right it just says beets okay so unless noted on here we're, we're assuming that we're talking about planting seeds for this okay so so as if i move over here the end of september i can plant those direct from seed and i'm going to be in good shape if I if I have a transplant of this, we could say that we we could go later. Okay, so when I plant this from seed, it's got to go through that whole process of germination. So it's going to be a little bitty seedling, and then it's going to grow and grow, and then it's going to start. The weather is going to start getting cooler, and it's going to take off. But if I cheat this and I just buy a little four inch plant, I can plant it later in the year and it's going to take off and be about the same size as those seeds that I planted way back here, okay? So a lot of these, there are options, but you know, we'll tend to recommend, like on cauliflower, we could plant it from seed, but we're saying transplant so right here is when we would recommend to plant your transplants of these right now. So if I was going to plant these from seed, I would need to do that a little earlier. Get those seeds in the ground the beginning of September and let them germinate so that they'll start growing right around the end of this month when it starts cooling off. Okay. So we've got transplants over here uh, we've got some of these says bulbs multipliers so these are start plants it's going to designate what we're recommending that you start with on these but again all these that don't say anything here or just uh, those are those are from seed direct and in, direct into the garden seed so hopefully that answers the question that we had earlier. Peggy, do we have any other questions on hold? We have a question about garlic. Um, the participant has had has tried several soft neck varieties without much luck and are wondering they're wondering what a good variety would be for us. And there you have it. Yeah, and I'll go in real quick. So a couple of the varieties, obviously the uh, 10, 10, 15 yellow onion uh, was a A&M introduction, actually, um, which basically this 10, 15 on here designates that we're going to plant that on October 15th, if you didn't know what that means. And then the Y, usually if it's 10, 15 Y, that means that it's a yellow onion um, for the naming. Uh, but yeah, and that's, you know, some of these, that's what happens here. Uh, it could be because of the lack of nutrients that these stems become weak and then they want to lodge over before the bulb is mature underground. So, you know, almost equally as important as the variety selection is just that we have the amount of fertility that those plants need for them to grow. Let's see. 
Okay. So, um, so I'll take you to this real quick, and um, if we have time, maybe I'll just go through these resources. Uh, but this right here, the Easy Garden Fact Sheets on Aggie Horticulture, we've got a, a huge selection of those. And then there's this Vegetable Variety Recommendations tool. And these are both very good for homeowners here to utilize. Um, let me go ahead and open that up. So I'm just going to open that up. And I think Peggy has probably put the URL to this into the chat box. Um, but I'm going to take you to so Aggie Horticulture. So I just tell people usually if you type in Aggie Hort or Aggie Horticulture into your search engine, it'll pop right up. And then from there, we're going to go down to this where it says vegetable resources. And click on that and that takes you to the page that I had in the presentation. We have these easy gardening fact sheets. So this is the the gold mine right here. OK, so each of the common vegetable crops for Texas have their own information page here. This is a downloadable PDF tells you everything that you need to know about getting those individual crops planted. And then this section right here, uh, these are all kind of planting considerations and maintenance. So we've got composting, fertilization, harvesting, uh, herbs. Uh, if you want to know more about herbs here, um, insects, mulching, planting, planting, um, etc. We've got um, a lot of very good publications. As you can see, the stars here, uh, a lot of new publications are being added this year um, because our specialists are spending more time uh, in their offices writing instead of being out in the field doing programming. So that's been a good thing for all of us. And if I go back here to this vegetable variety recommendations, I can click on this. It divides the state up into regions. We are in this region's G. And so I can select a crop and I will just go down to onion. And then select. And this is going to give me um, a, a list of onions that are um, recommended for our area. OK, not to say that this is are the only onions that are good for us, but these are recommended varieties um, that we've researched that they are available and do grow well for us so pretty easy to, to look up stuff if you if you don't want to mess around with each crop once you've selected southeast texas we can do select all and this will pull up everything okay so like i said earlier i can download this as a pdf and print it and then I can take this whole sheet with me when I go to the garden center and I can cross compare what varieties I see in the garden center versus uh, which ones I want to plant here based off of the recommendations. So very easy to use cool tools out there. All right, I think that just about wraps it up here. There's a couple uh, websites again. Aggie Horticulture is where we're going to get a lot of um, our plant uh, based publications. Soil testing .tamu is our soil and water testing laboratory where you can go to get your soil or water tested. Plant clinic is our disease diagnostic lab. So if you have a plant that is sick and we haven't been able to figure out what's going on with it, you can send a sample of that plant to that lab and they will um, identify the problem and give you recommendations. FBMG.org is the website for the Fort Bend Master Gardeners. And uh, this is a fantastic website that's been updated this year, and there's a lot of really good resources on there. Um, and then our Fort Bend uh, County AgriLife website, we've got a calendar of events, et cetera, 
on that website. Um, and uh, also, uh, both of us, uh, Fort Bend Extension and Fort Bend Master Gardeners are on Facebook and Instagram. So like us, love us, all that good stuff. So I'm going to stop sharing.